going to follow up Hi. the second Hi. part of uh, uh, the labor today. And uh, uh, I want you to listen carefully to how God connected the Old Testament approach to God to Himself and how Jesus taught that in the New Testament. So today we're going to speak on the topic, the washing of water by the Word, and uh, you uh, stand with me as we read. From Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 27. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. That's good news, isn't it? Because it's up there said some stuff that wives may have some problems with. But then it turned around and said that the first prerequisite for any of it is that you love your wife. Even as Christ loved the church, oh my Lord, that's even a bigger uh, impact of statement. Uh, and gave himself for it. That he, meaning Jesus Christ, might sanctify and cleanse it, meaning the church, with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church. Huh. We are talking about approaching God as the Old Testament taught, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Word of God this morning. We're excited, Father, for the Word. We pray that you'd open our eyes, that we could see in our ears, that we could hear what the Word of God is saying to us so that we can apply it to our heart so that we can apply it to our lives, so that we can be changed into the image of your dear Son. Bless us now. We surrender to the Word of God. We surrender to the Holy Spirit. May your Word come forth in revelation and truth and be a blessing to the people. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And you may be seated. I want to go back up to verse 26 and 27, and I simply want to address them real quickly. That he might sanctify and cleanse it, meaning the church with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it, the church, to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it might be holy and without blemish. Paul is teaching the New Testament church as God presented the approach to himself in the Old Testament. When they stood before the labor, they stood at the labor having been brought from the blood. Once they got to the labor, there was a presenting of themselves and a washing of the water that was a sanctifying and cleansing purpose to the priest. So that he could present himself before God without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that he, it, should be holy and without blemish. There was nothing, nothing that the priest could approach God with, period. It had to be holy. The labor is the basin that represents the word of God's influence that occurs in the inner man. The word of God, as we know the word of God, occurred in John chapter 1. That is Jesus Christ. So Paul said that he, God, might sanctify and cleanse it, the church, with the washing of water by the Word who is Jesus Christ. 
So as the church came about being the church, it came about by the Word, Jesus Christ. As the church was given the opportunity to not only know God, but to approach God, as God had set the stage and the platform in uh, Moses' time, through the tabernacle, God set the stage for you to come into the presence of God by the washing that came by Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That refers to Jesus Christ. He is the one who today is cleansing and purging every believer so that our reflection can become the image of Jesus. I want to share with you a piece of the gospel that Jesus offered to the disciples that has been overlooked as the New Testament connection to the labor. Now, we often execute the sacrament of communion. We often execute it and we say, this is my body, this is my blood, and all of those wonderful statements that Jesus said, do this and remember me. But there was a connection to the Old Testament. In that communion process that Jesus gave to the disciples, and I don't believe we have connected the two. There are three portions of Scripture that I'm going to look at today that will connect them for you. The first portion of Scripture I want to look at is Matthew 26, 26, and 27. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when He had taken and given thanks, He broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take ye, this is my body. Here Jesus is referencing the body that was provided to be the sacrifice. So we can connect what Jesus is doing to the brazen altar. Because it was the broken body and the blood from the broken body of the animal that was burned and the blood taken and put on all four corners of the horn and poured around all four sides of the brazen altar so that the sacrifice for sin, the burnt offering, the sacrifice of the meal offering, the sacrifice of the peace offering, and the sacrifice of the uh, uh, fifth part offering were all put in there. Now the sin offering, we know, was done outside the camp, but the blood was still provided on the brazen altar. So Jesus is here referencing. Now I want to tell you this before I go any further. Jesus Christ was all five parts of the offerings. He was the offering that was the burnt offering. He was the offering that was the meal offering. He was the offering that was the uh, peace offering. He was the offering that was the sin offering. He was the offering that was the satisfaction of the fifth part of it. He was all of that for you and I. Notice that there were only two bodies provided during the tabernacle. Sacrifice. One for the burnt offering, which was, now watch this now. One for the burnt offering, which was to be identified with the individual's complete surrender to God. And one body for the sin offering, which was to be done outside the camp. The surrender offering, or the burnt offering, was partially eaten to identify with the sacrifice and to ingest the symbolic surrender of the offering to God. So when Jesus broke this and gave it to them, remember the burnt offering was an offering that was eaten. It was an offering that the offerer would say, I burn this part and I eat this part, but I spread the blood from the offering. 
And it was eaten in a form that would say to God that what this meat is being put into is totally surrendered to you. Now here is Jesus on His way to the cross. Here is Jesus on His way to surrender Himself to something that the Bible said He could have called 10,000 angels. The songwriter said He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set it free. But because He was totally surrendered to the plan of God and the sacrifice of Himself for your sin, now he sits in front of the disciples and breaks this bread and says, Take, eat. This is my body that is surrendered for you. So the disciples went through this communion, as we call it, and they said in ingesting the elements, When you surrender Jesus, I surrender also. Now we can see in the lives of the disciples that their surrender at the meal did not reflect their surrender in real life. We know that Peter denied the Lord. The Bible declares that they scattered for fear. That they joined in the upper room for fear of the Jews. But in them was something that would bring them back together. And in them was something that would cause them to be in the upper room. And in them was something that when Jesus walked in the upper room, that, that they would look at him. And in them was something that when Jesus spoke peace to Something inside of them resonated. What was it, preacher? It was what Jesus had done when he gave them his body. And they ingested him. Their outer man was going crazy. But when Jesus said, Peace be unto you, what they had ingested of him leapt into action. Even if they left and said, this is the Lord. What a glorious thing. Because whenever He is in you, He will come to you. Think about it. When He is in you, He will come to you. And when He comes to you, He will speak a word to you. And the word will be, peace be unto you. He said it to them twice. The first time he said peace, their spirit rose because they recognized the master. Peace. What a great God. So here is Jesus. And they're ingesting the symbolic surrender even though the outer man was not surrendered. The outer man was living in fear. The outer man was scattered. The outer man was cursing. But when he came, and when he showed up, he came with a word that would speak into their spirit. And all of a sudden, they knew that it was him. And they surrender to Him. And they begin to worship and praise. And He said, touch me. And they said, we have been with Him. Everything is going to be all right. Church, there comes a time in your life if you have ingested Him that He will come to you with the Word. And the Word will always be the same. It'll be peace. It'll be my peace I give to you. And your spirit will 
raised up on the inside of you. And you will be able to walk with him and put your chest out and say, I have seen the Lord. Oh, I've been to Calvary, but I've been beyond Calvary. And I have seen the Lord. When he said, take it, this is my body, they understood that he was about to surrender himself. You say, Pastor, how would they know that? These were Jews. These were Jews who had sat at the feet of their mama. They had heard the teaching and the reading of God's word. They had sat and listened to the Jewish mother tell them about how God had delivered Israel out of Egypt. That God had delivered it across the river. And God had run back the sea. And how Moses had taught them about the tabernacle. And how there was a place and a tribe totally dedicated to the approach of God. They knew the story. Said, take heed. They understood that the surrender the burnt offering, the surrender offering was totally there. His message to them was when you eat this, you're surrendering yourselves to me. You're surrendering yourselves to the work that I'm about to make a way for you to complete. Surrendering, I himself, Jesus, was surrendering to the plan of God and to operate the plan of God. Do you know what the plan of God was? You'll say to me, it was the cross. It was the innermost parts of the earth. It was the resurrection. It was Jesus being seen of over 500. It was the ascension. It was the presentation. It was the acceptance. And it was the seeing. And I say yes, 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 eight times yes. But the significance goes beyond all of those. And Paul described it as a mystery when he said these words. And the mystery is that Christ is in you the hope of glory. to this whole thing. He is in me. History tells us every piece of the things that I said prior to Colossians 1.7. Those are historical fact. But history will only determine whether Christ is in you based on how you surrender your life to live for Jesus Christ in the day in which we walk. That's the only historical fact the world will ever see or will ever know is how is He living in you and are you surrendered to Him, His work, His way and the divine operation of the plan of Almighty God. Then he took the cup and said, Drink from it all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine from now on until that day when I drink from it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This is the blood of the new covenant. Here we recognize that there was a connection now to the sin offering. The blood poured out upon the horns. The horns that faced north, faced north, south, east, and west. The blood poured out around the sides of the burnt brazen altar that faced in the other four directions that identified to mankind that the entire world is covered by one man's 
blood and one sacrifice. The blood was put on the horns. The blood was put on the sides. Jesus would later tell these same men, now watch this now, in what directions to take the blood. He would say, you begin in Jerusalem, then you begin in Samaria, then you go to Judea, then you begin to go to Samaria, and then you go into all the world. The blood works everywhere. The blood changes everything. Take this blood, drink of it, and in you will spring up a hope of glory. And that hope is the day spring. That hope is the beautiful rose of Sharon. That hope is the son of God. That hope is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one, the only son of Almighty God. So it's clear that Jesus acted out, now watch it now, the activity of the brazen altar. For the men of whom he ate the Passover meal. He declared to them the things that God had designed, watch it now, for worship. By the children of Israel, that was being brought under the relationship of him to them. Their surrender now would be to him and him alone and not to an animal. It would never again be tied to an animal. There would be no blood of an animal that would ever be sacrificed again that would stand for one thing in the economy of God. Only the blood of one man, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, would stand forevermore and eternity to be the economy of God whereby men might be saved. He directed them to identify the forgiveness of sin now rested in himself. What a great time for them. Although the revelation and the significance of this meal didn't register upon them until later. Paul declares the same event using the word broken. Watch this. And when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, take it, this is my body. Now we know that not one piece, no bone of Jesus' body was broken. But in order for the sacrifice offering to work and for the offering to be a surrender offering, something had to break. What broke in Jesus was his own desire and his own will. Paul said, this is my body broken, which is broken for you. Church, if you are going to know Jesus Christ and live in the image of Jesus Christ, then you will understand that the only methodology for surrender is to be broken before Him and have a contrite heart before Him. The broken and contrite heart is a heart that God will pour Jesus Christ into and change that man into the very image of the person for which you are broken. That's what He did for the disciples. See, when they got broken, and surrendered to him. He poured himself into them until Peter would look at the man and say, rise up and walk in the name of Jesus. And he left to his feet and was sound. And they said, how did you do this? And he said, we did nothing. It was the name of Jesus, the sacrifice for sin and his blood said 
this man free. Yeah! Here you see the bringing of the body and the complete surrender. Are you surrendered to Him today? The biggest question that I could ask you today is to evaluate yourself. Are you surrendered to Him? Is your life surrendered to Him? Is your mouth surrendered to Him? Are your thoughts surrendered to Him? When you get up, are you surrendered to Him? When you go to work, are you surrendered to Him? Surrender! Surrender! That's what Jesus was teaching the disciples at communion. We come and stand before the communion table. Take this, do this in remembrance of me. And our mouth doesn't change. Our mind doesn't change. But when the priest came to the labor, he knew better. Because he knew that if he took three, four more steps into the door of the tabernacle, spotted by the world, wrinkled by the world, or any such thing, it meant death. Oh. We come all the time bearing the burdens of the world, carrying our weight of sin that does so easily throw us for a loop and wonder where God is. And the answer is, He's in the thing. He is not in the things you're carrying. He will be in you, on you, and upon you if you will get to the washing of the water by the Word and be changed. Anything else? Anything else cannot stand before a holy God. Now the common method of looking at this was to identify the brokenness of the bread. That is true. But the use of the word broke has significance to the method of which God, Jesus, lived his life. He was the burnt offering. Then he said this, do in remembrance of me. Do what? When you come to the place where the Holy Spirit is correcting, convicting, convincing and judging you, your life and your look into the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus, the first thing you must do is to look into the life of surrender. If you're coming and He is convicting, convincing and judging and you're not changing, then the very thing that Jesus did in dying at Calvary's tree you crucify Him over and over and over again. And you get nothing out of the death of Jesus Christ, nothing out of the communion with His Word, nothing out of the washing of the Word, but yet you desire to approach a holy God. Let me just say how that will work. It won't. And life will be troubled and trial. Now let's look at the phrase to do with this as a remembrance of me. Now after supper being ended, now watch this. This is where we're getting to the labor. The things that I have just described have been done in the hearing of the disciples. Jesus was about to give an expression of pure love to his own, which is what he does. The devil having now been put in the heart of Jesus to scare it, Simon's son to betray him. Did you hear that? At the very time when Jesus is teaching the word of God and surrender and the breaking of his body and the blood sitting right in the crowd is a man that evil, the devil is working in. And we wonder why our churches have so much trouble. Because we failed to submit. Judas could have submitted. He was given the opportunity to stand before Jesus Christ and be changed. Someone said, yeah, but the plan of God. Why is Jesus doing it with Judas present? The betrayal and the betrayal is placed into action. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, 
Jesus knows that the Father has told him concerning the outcome of the events that were about to occur. He rises up from supper. Now watch this because this is where I want to go. He rises up from supper, lays aside his garments, takes a towel, and girds himself. He leads his disciples to the wash basin. He leads his disciples to the labor. Where the word from John chapter 1 will kneel and bow their feet and wash their feet with his own hands. With his own hands. The word of God bowing down before men who in a few days are going to run and hide. Who are going to be despondent who are going to be depressed, who are going to eventually curse Him, who are going to be scattered, but something is being placed in their inner man that they will not be able to get away from. Jesus bows and with His own hands He begins to wash their feet. After that He poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. And to wipe them with a towel wherewith he was girded. He began to wash them with the towel that, that girded himself. He began to wash them with the towel of which he girded himself. He wiped them down with a towel. When they looked into the wash basin now, this is what I want you to see. They saw two reflections. See, in the labor, they looked into the water, and the mirror said to them, I see you. And you think about what you need to get right. Because if you in the mirror don't get it right, if you step into my tabernacle, you will die. The priest looked in and saw you. Uh -uh. He saw me, 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 and me. So they had to correct me. They had to make sure that everything in their life was washed clean without spot or wrinkle because on the inside of the tent of blessing stood the Holy God. When Jesus washed their feet, He would bow with them over the water. And when they looked into the water, initially they saw two reflections. They saw themselves, but overlaid was Jesus. They looked into the water and they saw two faces, not one. So when they saw the two faces in the water, there was two. But then Jesus dipped his hand into the water and the two faces became one. Because as the water was mixed, the vision was mixed. They would see themselves and Jesus and then you couldn't figure out who was who. You could only see that there was someone in the water. You could only see that there was reflections coming from the water. But you couldn't figure out whether it was me or whether it was Jesus. And as they looked into the water and they began to 
to see the co-mingling of the two, the message to them was, I and you will be together closer than a brother. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be your hope of glory. And when you approach the Father, you don't approach Him by yourself because when He sees you, He sees me. Oh, glory to God. When you stand before the Father, you stand in the image of the one to whom you surrendered, who washed you by the blood, who made you the righteousness of God. He sees your righteousness because he sees me. So when he washed their feet, all of a sudden they begin to visually connect the relationship that Jesus would be in them and that the Father would see Jesus before he saw them. What a blessing. What a revelation. The foot washing was just not because you wore sandals. The foot washing was a lesson and a message that had happened in the tabernacle that only happened to priests. It did not happen to a common. Paul would go on to tell us about the royal priesthood. The Word of God goes on to tell us who we are in Christ. We're a peculiar people. Why? Because we're commingled with Jesus. When God sees him, he sees us. When God sees us, he sees him. We're peculiar in that way. Amen. My God. So when he washed them, this is what he said to them. Well, let me go to this first before I go to that. Simon Peter said, I don't want you to do it. I don't want you to wash me. I know who you are. I don't want you to wash me. He said, you're going to wash my feet? Why did he say that, Pastor? Because he didn't understand what Jesus was telling him. You're going to approach God. You're going to have to be commingled with me. And in order to be commingled with me, you will only commingle to me when you are surrendered. And surrender will bring holiness. And holiness will bring your entrance into the throne room of God. Peter said, No, can be so. Jesus answered him and said, What I do thou to thou now, you know it's not. You don't understand it yet. But I'm building something in your spirit that will cause you to always remember me. Do you think they remembered so deeply and desperately the meals that they had at Mary's house? No, oh, that was just another meal. But they would always remember the communion. That would always draw them back to the blood and the body that they saw sacrificed on the tree. The communion would always draw them back to the Word of God kneeling and washing them and the commingled vision of the reflection of them and Jesus and all of a sudden they couldn't tell the difference. They would always remember that. He said, you'll remember this hereafter. Peter said, no, nah, don't just wash my feet. Uh, uh, wash me all over. Wash my head, wash my hands. Now, I won't go into that, but I want to go here. <clears throat> Jesus said, He that is washed of me need not to wash anything more than his feet because he's clean all over. Now, I want to show you something. I want you to get this. I stand up. I wash my hands. The wash basin is down here. 
I wash my face. The wash basin is down here. It is not until I sit down and bend over that I can wash my feet in a wash basin. Come here, David. Sit right here for me. As David sits in the wash basin, he's looking into the water. As I kneel over the water to begin to wash his feet, his Reflection and my reflection both appear in the water. You see, friends, when they washed their hands, when Jesus, the reason he said, you need not but your feet, because that was the point in time when both brethren would look into the water and make a determination that the two of them were no longer separate entities. But the two of them were equal in the water of which the Word, Jesus Christ, was sanctifying them and creating in them the purging of washing by the Word Himself until they would be equal in the sight of God and for heavenly entrance into the throne room of God when the water shows David, it shows Jesus. And when the water shows Jesus, it shows David. When we wash, when we rinse, we are being seen in heaven as the very Son of Almighty God. And our entrance now is secure and accepted forever by the Lamb of God. Glory to God. Thank you, David. See, that's why his feet had to be washed. Because when it got there, both entities became one. Bow your head and close your eyes. i got to finish this next week. Now, Father, today, oh, God, we long to be one with you. We long to understand our position in you. We long, Father. We yearn. We yearn. We yearn to understand how to be surrendered. How to be commingled with Christ. So that Christ may be in us the hope of glory. That hope of glory may give us complete entrance into the throne room of God. Now God, we know that you see us as we are made the righteousness of God. In the wash basin, the disciple and your son were made to be one. They were made holy. They were washed clean. They were sanctified by the Word of God. Now, Father, as I stand here today, I ask you to sanctify us. I ask you to wash us holy. I ask you to help us to understand the co-mingling presence of God through Jesus Christ that allows us to be called and to be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, Father, we stand today at the wash basin. And we don't see our own reflection. And you don't see the reflection of me. But you see the commingled reflection of Jesus Christ. Now I ask the question. Thank you, Lord. I ask you the question, listener. Friend of mine, 
faithful church member. Whenever you're seen in heaven, whenever God looks at you, is He seeing the surrendered, holy, without spot, without blemish, peculiar person? The peculiar person. The royal priest that God designed you to be. Is he seeing that in you? Because if he is not, then rest assured on this. You will not be called into the presence of God. Listen to what the word said. That he, Jesus, might present to himself a glorious church. Are you able to be presented today as a glorious church? Are you able to be saved? I have been to the wash basin. When I saw him, I saw me because he washed my feet and I'm clean. I have no spot, I have no wrinkle, nor any such thing, because I am in Christ, and Christ is in me. Because I am in Christ, and Christ is in me, <coughs> I'm holy and without blemish. I'm holy and without blemish. I'm holy and without blemish. Now as you bow your head, close your eyes. Holiness, spotlessness, your role in that is surrender. Your role in this is simply surrender. Surrender. We have an advocate with the Father through Jesus Christ. Surrender the things that you know don't reflect Him. Simply surrender it. Then eat of Him. Be surrendered as He was surrendered. Laying down the world and fulfilling the divine call of God. While you pray right now, I want you to ask God, to forgive you of anything, any thought, any idea that would not allow you to present yourself to him. While you pray, anything that you've done, anything that you've said, anything that you might have hurt someone else with, anything that you're walking in unforgiveness over, I want you to say, Lord, I, I ask your forgiveness today. He's faithful and just to forgive you. He's faithful and just to free you. He's faithful and just to make you whole. He's faithful and just. He is not a God that did not give you an avenue into His presence. That's the beautiful thing of this, friend. He's the God that has provided you the way, the truth, and the life. He's the God that has said, if you'll come unto me, I'll wash your feet, and me and you will be one. He's the God that's done that for you. You do not have to bear your burden and your weights and your problems alone. This is why I can't ever understand why people aren't flocking to the house of God. Outside of the house of God, you are alone. But in the house and the presence of God, whether it's in the church or wherever, when you are seeking holiness and righteousness, the Word of God declares that He is there. You don't have to go life alone. But you do have to surrender. You do have to surrender. You have to surrender yourself. Your wants, your ways, your wishes, 
your problems, your trials, your addictions, your issues, your opinions, you have to surrender to. And at the very moment you do, somewhere there will be a word. I don't know whether it will be in another room, I don't know whether it will be a car, I don't know whether it will be on the job site, I don't know whether it will be walking. I don't know whether you'll be working, I don't know whether you'll be eating, I don't know where you'll be. But somewhere, the Son of God will step through a door that you have closed on your own, that you have locked on your own, that you have tried on your own to say, I'm going to get through this and I'm going to hide away in here and maybe no one will see me and Jesus will come through a locked door that you have tried to keep him out with and say the words that will change your world. Peace! Peace be unto you. And your eyes will be opened and you will know that you have seen Jesus. But you must surrender. But you must surrender. But you must surrender. Now Lord, as you minister in hearts this morning, here's what I'm asking you to do. Cause them to just surrender. Surrender. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my precious Savior, I surrender all, right where you sit, right where you sit, surrender, whatever it is that you know is keeping you outside the gate because you can't go in unless you surrender. Can't go in unless the only thing seen in the water is the commingling of your reflection. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my precious Jesus, I surrender all. Have you prayed that prayer? Then if you prayed that prayer, if you say, I surrender to God, some of you may say, well, the Lord, I, I can't see anything in myself. But, but if there would be something, I surrender it to you today. I, I, I'm not knowing anything, but, but, but if there's anything that would keep me out of the blessed room, I give it up. Show me and I'll give it up. And then if there's those of you that know, you've got things and issues and thoughts and ideas and problems and words that are harmful and hurtful. And you need to surrender today. I want you to stand to your feet and join me at the altar. Come on. Come join me. Everything that is good happens when a man makes his way to, the, to an altar. Every blessing happens when a man makes his way to an altar. I surrender. I surrender. I surrender. I surrender now. As you stand before me today, I want you to prayerfully with your eyes closed say these words out of your mouth. Jesus, I surrender. Jesus, I surrender. I give myself to you. I give the things that you know are in me. 
that should not be. I surrender. I give it up. I won't go back to it. I won't go back to it. I want you to wash me. I want to see you in me. I have brought me to the altar today. And as I'm standing at your altar, I ask your spirit to change me and to resurrect in me Jesus Christ. I receive it. it belong, he belongs to me. I am changed. From this day forward, the image of His dear Son resides in me. I am not the same. I refuse to go back to a life that is evil and killing me. I denounce the world. And I receive Jesus and His blessings upon my life. Without spot and without wrinkle, I present myself to you in Jesus' name. I enter into the love and I am the righteousness of God because of Jesus Christ. Raise your hands and praise Him. Father, we thank You today. Thank You today for cleansing. Thank You today, God, for salvation, for cleansing, for purging, for sanctification. Thank You today for freedom. Thank You today for liberty. Thank You today for love. Thank You today for Jesus Christ in me and the hope of glory that comes with His presence. Glory to God. Praise Him just a minute. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. We praise you today, Jesus, for the Word that makes us free. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. 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 Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Thank you, Jesus. We are not the same. We are not the same. We are not the same. I'm not my own. I belong to Jesus. He purchased me. I'm all His. Bought with a price. The blood of Jesus. I'm not my own. I'm not my own. I belong to Jesus. He purchased me. I'm all His. Bought with a price the blood of Jesus. I'm not my own. I So good. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, bless God, Father, bless thee that come to hear the word. I pray that you will anoint them as they leave from here and that the precious glory of God will give them entrance into the throne room of God when they call that the throne door will open and God will be there and you will be there and Jesus will be there and the Holy Spirit and all the cloud of witness will be there to tell them you are welcome to enter into the throne room of God. Yes. 
Glory be to God forevermore. Bless them as they go home. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you're dismissed.